Hello, and welcome to Cover Your Eyes Podcast. Today, we're talking about American Gigolo from 1980, starring Richard Gere. Hey, Holly. Hi, Sarah. Um, so you had recommended this movie, and I know that you like it. You've seen it a few times. I've only seen it once, and I really liked it, too. So I'm excited to talk about it. But I feel like I'm going to let you kind of lead the discussion and ask you to do the summary. (laughs) All right. I'll do the summary. So first of all, I just want to say this movie is directed by Paul Schaefer. (laughs) When he wasn't playing in David Letterman's band. (laughs) That's what Isaac said to me. (laughs) Like almost word for word. (laughs) Isaac's a cool dude. (laughs) (laughs) The Mm -hmm. real director is Paul Schrader. Paul Schrader, who directed Cat People. We won't hold that against him. (laughs) (laughs) And also wrote Taxi Driver. Yeah. So there's that. Julian, Richard Gere, he is a gigolo. He sells his sexual attention to women. He picks them up in hotels, in the bars, and restaurants. He likes his things. He likes his Armani suits and his fast car and his stereo equipment. Which we forget how expensive stereo equipment used to be. That's true. So it's like you could get a system for, you know, a thousand bucks. He goes to see client and it's a guy and he's like, wait a second. And he's like, no, it's my wife. I want you to fuck my wife. It's totally obvious. This dude's a ghoul. We don't see a lot. Then basically... Later, she's dead. The cops think he did it. He's also having, he's having an emotional relationship with a senator's wife who provides the alibi that he needs. And everybody's like, of course, because she just like totally blew up her life. I mean, it's implied that he's let go. You realize at the very end of the movie that this is actually a love story. Having never seen this movie, I've definitely always heard of it. I really enjoyed it even more than I thought I would. It was was just so good. And it took me a minute to realize how hilarious it was (laughs) that it was Richard Gere playing a male escort. (laughs) And then thinking about Pretty Woman later, how he was picking her up. I was like, wait a minute, this is so funny. And then realizing who the detective was in American Gigolo is the man who works in the hotel with Pretty Woman who helps Julia Roberts get her makeover. Really? Did you not realize that? No. Yes. The detective that's after him, Detective Day or whatever his name is. Detective Sunday. Detective Sunday. He is uh, Barney in the Pretty Woman movie that helps Julia Roberts. I know. That's amazing. I love that. And then I also noticed like all of the parallels to the movie Deuce Bigelow. (laughs) I've never seen that. (laughs) (laughs) And Rob Schneider. It's funny watching it in the beginning. I'm like, oh, okay. I see what they're doing. Um, Is Gigolo supposed to ride with Gigolo? Yeah. It's like Deuce Bigelow, male Gigolo is the name of the movie. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So is there an updated term for Gigolos? Like, uh, do we just call them sex workers or do men still like to be called Gigolos? (laughs) What is I'm not the origin of that word. I could have looked that up. I'm surprised. Yeah, it didn't even occur to me until right now. So Julian's doing a job for this guy. And you can tell that Julian used to be under the tutelage of this man, Leon. Leon. And that he left to be madamed by by this woman he has these fancy clients now that take him to sotheby's auctions and buy him for 1200 stereo equipment leon 
I mean, I felt like it was pretty obvious that Leon was kind of bitter. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you know, do this job for me. And so he's like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And then Leon says this weird thing where he's like, you know, you can't trust those bitches. Like, they'll just drop you if you get into trouble. Mm -hmm. And this really unsettled feeling, like, came over me. I mean, did you, how did you, what did you think about that? That speech that he was giving him? Yeah, or? like, where were, where was your head at? Because you haven't seen this before. Right. So I'm curious about what your responses are. Because I have a totally different history with this movie. For the whole thing, like whether or not I thought he did it and all of that? or. He- uh yeah, like I'm curious about your your the process of that because for me, I guess like as a kid, I saw this movie with my mom and mm-hmm. <laughs> I actually think my dad too. Whoa. So like I don't remember the whole thing and when I was a kid, I did not pick up on most of the movie because mm-hmm. it was like a rented they rented it. Yeah. And so I was probably like seven or eight or something. And I know I was, I remember it though, because I remember being embarrassed about my mom thinking that Richard Gere was like a hunk. Uh huh. And so all I remembered about the movie as it from a kid was like Richard Gere kind of like, going around to different buildings looking good you know he's like a sharp dressed man his hair's done just right he just worked out he spent two hours primping himself everything is about beauty and that was really all I remembered I didn't realize that it was like a murder mystery yeah so then when I saw it later maybe 10 years ago or something it was really like a completely different movie to me. It was a, com- it just was, it was like completely different. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, this is like a gritty murder mystery. There's an undertone of violence, sexual violence against women. I mean, I didn't know that there was going to be any type of murder, murder mystery at all. I thought it was just going to continue with the sex. And the nice clothes. So it kind of was like, oh, and then that became like, you know, the dominant part of the movie in the second half, pretty much. And I was just like, hmm. I honestly feel like I could have done without all of that. I wish it would have just continued more with his life and his like love story with Lauren Hutton and all of that. I still enjoyed it. It just felt like a 180 from what I was expecting. It was like, hmm. So I was really enjoying just seeing Richard Gere being like an attractive man who took pride in his appearance and didn't have any shame in that and enjoyed having nice clothes and enjoyed working on his body and enjoyed looking good for women. But it seemed like very natural, you know, it's like, yes, I am having a great time making myself look great and feel great and making these women feel great. and. He preferred older women, which was like, what is going on? (laughs) They're just so like, this movie really happening. It seems like so refreshing that it's like a super attractive man. And he's just like laying himself out there to be pleasing to women, older women who their husbands have pretty much cast aside probably for their secretaries, you know, and like society has just cast aside And that's like his specialty. And he says that he enjoys it. And I was like, God, this is amazing. Yeah. And I was just blown away by all of that aspect of it. So like his first client is, um, so he'll say like, (laughs) 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 my soundproof tiles keep falling off. I swear I'm going to have my shit together by the next episode. (laughs) No problem. I mean, what else can I do? my god anyways so 
Yeah, he is like at the top of his game as far as being a gigolo. And he used to work with Leon, it seems like, like you said. Now he's with this other woman and he's calling the shots. So he's like, oh, well, if I'm going to do this for you, I'm getting 60, you're getting 40. And it's like, he's breaking all the rules of what a traditional like sex worker would be doing as far as an arrangement. Mm -hmm. Um, But he's like, well, you know that I'm the best and I can get into the LA country club and all these other places and who else can do that? So he's like, I know that I'm the best. I know that I'm worth it. So I'm going to take this percentage and I'm going to call the shots. And I feel like he's just really loving his life. Don't you think? Yeah. He has a loyal following. Yes, of these repeat customer older women. Yeah, he's deriving great pleasure from pleasing them. Yes, literally. And also (laughs) from being taken care of by them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought that makes sense. I mean, how how is that any different than a woman who does that? Mm -hmm. Um with older men and people say oh she's you know has daddy issues or whatever and it's like this guy a julian does need a lot of sexual attention and approval that's what he thrives on he is living his best life but at the same time it's like there's always the knowledge that it's fleeting mm-hmm. because the crucial element of that kind of work is your appearance. And there's a really low level of control that you have over your appearance in some ways that like aging or whatever that like people just you age out of certain profession. So there's yeah. already that undercurrent of like, how much longer can he keep at it? Yeah. How old is he in this movie? Do you uh, think? Do they say? I think he's like, I. they don't. I don't know. I guess I assumed he was like 30. Yeah. I was thinking like 29 or something. Mm-hmm. So I guess it may be good that he's has a clientele of older women because even then as he gets older, there'll always be women that are older than him. And so he'll still look <laughs> like a young tasty <laughs> thing to them. When he's like 60, he'll be with 80 year olds yeah. <laughs> and he'll be used to it. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> That's a good so, point. <laughs> <laughs> like the first client that he has. So he'll say that they'll, they'll call and say that they want a chauffeur or a guide right like oh I'm new in town and I need a guide around town and so that's like their Mm -hmm. key their code word for his services and like the first client that he goes to see um it's this older woman who's coming to town to like do something with her husband's estate and it's like a woman I would say what in her 50s or 60s just like average looking woman well dressed so you can tell she's wealthy Mm -hmm. and it looks like she would probably be playing like a grandma on a show from the fifties or sixties and she's attractive, but it's just like, Whoa, wait, is he going to sleep with her? Cause you never see things like this. And I was like, is this what's really happening? Does she really think he's a chauffeur or did she hire him for sex? And then it like progresses and you're like, (laughs) okay, they are not going to have sex. I was just blown away. (laughs) Like this movie blew my mind. I like, I've never seen anything like this. You don't see this. And it was so amazing to watch like this woman who's so timid. And so it's 1980. She's in her fifties or sixties. So, you know, she was just like a quiet, perfect housewife in a wealthy family, not doing anything wrong. Probably her husband called all the shots. No one ever listened to her. She was just there to look pretty and host parties And then now she's like with this young man who's there to like sexually satisfy her. And at first she's like really timid. And then she starts kind of giving him orders, like open the champagne and sit over here and stuff. And it was just like, you could see her transforming and like feeling her power and like starting to own the situation and like get into it. And I was just like, it was, I loved it. (laughs) That's great. The direction and the cinematography, like 
they treat Julian as a sex object Mm -hmm. with the same camera angles, the same lingering over Julian, the way that the way that women are treated in movies. I wonder how many guys felt really uncomfortable watching this. Yeah. I'm I'm curious about that. I know that one thing I remember is like, you know, my mom talking about how, what a hunk Richard Gere was. Mm -hmm. And so that made me immediately kind of roll my eyes and not see him as sexual because my mom did it's interesting to watch now because I do understand why women were like crazy for him but I also see it from like we are being manipulated by the camera the camera's gaze to lust after Julian and everything about him is set up for the viewer to watch him and there's a really all of the camera angles are really voyeuristic and there's lots of camera angles where it, the camera is actually following behind Julian as he enters places and so you know see- that I like that <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> You see the the women's reaction yeah. to Julian's beauty. Mm-hmm. And Julian is like a spectacle of beauty and desire. So mm-hmm. then he gets introduced to a man who women do not respond to this man the way they respond to Julian. He's the husband that calls Julian. To fuck his wife brutally. He's like, I don't do F stuff mm-hmm. when he sees the guy. And then the guy's like, it's not me, it's my wife. So they're in Palm Springs, which I was like, Palm Springs, because I always love to see people driving there. And it's this amazing house. And yeah, you can tell it's just like a super wealthy couple. And he's filling in for someone that is supposedly backed out at the last minute that Leon set him up in this gig. And he almost didn't take this gig because he had to get a haircut. He's like, I can't, I'm getting my hair cut. Then. <laughs> I was like, that's so great. It just goes completely along with all of his vanity. Um, yeah. The guy like leads Julian into the bedroom. The wife is just laying there, basically like a mannequin. She doesn't speak really. She doesn't move. She's already like naked in the bed. This just blonde woman. And Julian's talking to her and like saying all these like, really racy things to her. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Yeah. And she's just like literally not reacting at all. It's almost like she was already drugged or something. Well, I, it's so what I guess my, where my imagination went with the setup is that he, this guy has a routine. Mm -hmm. He drugs his wife, he watches a hired, hand fuck her then he probably beats her mm-hmm. and that's like his cycle yeah and then he's like i can't believe you fucked that guy and then he beats her for like fucking the guy that he forced her to fuck yeah uh-huh. and then this time it got out of hand or i mean i guess i just thought it was got out of hand this time i have questions yeah i mean what did you think because you could also go with like that it didn't get out of hand but that he planned it that's why he he hired a new guy Mm -hmm. julian to do it so he could frame julian because he knew he was gonna kill his wife yeah what if (laughs) she was asserted herself just asserted her right. You know, that's probably what happened. She probably asserted her rights as a sovereign human in a natural way that everyone deserves to. And it upset his, it upset his little, his little tummy. And he got 
a boo-boo and he had a fit and he decided if I can't have you, nobody can because your property. And he already thinks of her as a sex object because he is just watching her have sex with people Mm -hmm. as a practice purely for his enjoyment. Cause it's clear. It's not for her enjoyment. Right. I have a few questions. Um, of what do you think happened? So it's all like a last minute thing. Julian was supposedly just called in because someone else didn't show up. And then he does this weird kind of gig that he doesn't normally do. And then it's like, was the husband planning to have her like go through this to get her used to what would happen the next time? Like put her through this routine and like this weird rough sex thing. And just then like later a day or two have it happen again, but that time have her killed. Because it seems like that they think it's Julian at first, but then they say that there's like other handcuff marks under the handcuffs that she's wearing when she's found. So it actually happened like two days later after he was with her. But before we realized that for a minute, I did think maybe he did do it because when he was talking to his manager, madam or whatever, she was like, did you do it, Jillian or Julian? It doesn't matter if you did. And then he just keeps like a blank stare. So then I'm like, no, well, maybe he did. But then later we hear that there's like, she's wearing a different set of handcuffs and there's bruises from the handcuffs he had her in before. And so, and when he's talking to Leon later, he's like, was it your new kid that did this? And then you set me up to cover up for your new like golden boy. And I think that's what happened. Right. Like the yeah. blonde kid that was like framing Julian and putting the jewels everywhere and the money everywhere. He was like the new hot young thing that Leon had hired. And when he, when that hot young thing went to do the same thing to that woman, he was like not as well trained because he's new and he got too aggressive and accidentally oh. killed her. But then Leon didn't want to lose his main new hot piece of ass and he already had a thing against julian because he resented him for leaving him and bucking the rules and so julian was like an easy scapegoat interesting i thought that the husband killed her Mm -hmm. um i thought well i guess how i imagined it went down like i was saying that this was like a routine Mm -hmm. that her husband had but something she asserted herself and he didn't like it because suddenly she was like a real human person, but I don't really know. I mean, ultimately Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a love story. Yeah. I could have just done without all of that murder part. When we meet Julian Everything in his life is about beauty, surface beauty, appearances. He's completely aesthetically oriented. Mm -hmm. He's driven by pleasure principles. Okay, he seems perfectly fine doing this, having this lifestyle. He's enjoying himself. And then he gets accused of murder. And he's suddenly persecuted. He destroys all of his own objects that he worked for by selling his own object, his own object being his body to these women. And he has all of these fancy clothes, fancy stereo, all of this stuff. And he goes through and rips all of it apart looking for what did that guy plant in my apartment? Cause he saw that golden boy moving out of his garage and he was like, I know something is somewhere, the jewelry that's missing. Cause there's missing jewelry and everything is destroyed in his life because up until this point, his whole life, is just his stuff. This is coinciding with him falling in love with a woman, which is not something that he does. 
with a client, but she tracked him down and is like, I'll pay you for sex. About paying for sex? I've never had to. Um, well, about what? <laughs> well, I guess just like, you know, he he's losing everything and then mm-hmm. he's finally saved. Like, finally a woman is saving him. And I guess I'm just wondering, it seems like he's filling this void with all of the stuff Mm -hmm. and all of these women's affections and what he really wanted, which he discovers because he's lost everything. It was a woman's love to save him Mm -hmm. and that he didn't even know he was lost. Yeah. Yeah it's a beautiful story yeah so julian feels like i think he feels like um he like you said he doesn't need love and like he's incapable of having an actual relationship that's kind of what he gets at at one point when she's talking to him he says also at one point like the people in my world look out for each other take care of each other that's what he thinks but then whenever he's of no use to them anymore then they don't take care of him like he goes to leon to look for an alibi like not knowing that leon's the one that set him up initially and um then he goes to anna his manager woman and he missed one of the jobs he's been waiting for for a long time he's learning swedish so that he could be the guy to the swedish woman And then because he's out like trying to figure out who's framing me for murder and like breaking into my house, he forgets about that job. And then so she's like, I'm done with you and I'm not helping you anymore. And he's basically just completely abandoned by everyone that he's been surrounded by. He kind of like played by his own rules. They were kind of ready to turn their back on him because he was not really doing what they wanted anyway. And now because it's kind of gotten around that he's been accused of murder, then all of his normal clientele is like really leery of being involved with him. So his whole world is crumbling. Well, also every cheater's worst nightmare, I would know is (laughs) having a detective show up on your doorstep. Yeah. Saying, Hey, it is the guy that you're sleeping with. Uh, Were you sleeping with him on such and such day? (laughs) Because he needs an alibi for murder. (laughs) yeah then you're questioning every life decision at that moment (laughs) pizza delivery (laughs) yeah so the woman that he actually was with at the time of the murder won't provide an alibi because it would destroy her life and so she's like i'm sorry it wasn't me she's willing to let him like go to jail for murder just to protect her reputation Mm -hmm. yeah awful and her husband's like backing her up and he knows but he doesn't want his life and reputation destroyed as well how embarrassing yeah how embarrassing your wife (sighs) has to pay for it (laughs) yeah so no one's got his back when he meets michelle then he's in a hotel bar like you said and first it's so funny because (laughs) It's like a single good looking dude sitting at a bar. And so normally in a movie, he'd be like scanning the crowd and he'd settle on a table of like 20 something like hot young things. And then he settles on a table of like 50 something (laughs) poker ladies or like bridge club ladies, you know, and he's like, oh, yeah. And then I just I was I loved it. And then he scans over to the next table and it's Lauren Hutton and she's like age appropriate. Is she older than him? She's like a little older than him, but not yeah. like his normal clientele. Yeah, not his normal clientele. Yeah. And so they make eye contact. And so he thinks that she like knows what's up and wants him to come over. But she just thinks, well, I'm attractive. He's attractive. We're alone. He's coming to talk to me. We're in a bar. Like she's not suspecting that he is looking for a job, you know? And then so they kind of have a back and forth. And then he's just like, this is what I'm here for. Isn't that what you wanted? And she's just like, 
no, this isn't what I wanted. You misunderstood. And he gets like defensive if someone actually does kind of call it what it is. You know what I mean? He likes to live under the illusion that he is not a male escort, even though he is. It's like it's demeaning to him if it's the the facade is blown. You know what I mean? And she's kind of like challenging that. And so he gets offended and he leaves. He wants to live in a world where women who need pleasure are going to get pleasure. And he's going to be reciprocated for being a good boy. And that's not sex work. That's having like lots of aunties. <laughs> With mm-hmm. silky panties. Oh my god! <laughs> what a gross phrase. I know <laughs> you just came up with. <laughs> yeah, by my asshole. <laughs> and I mean, like, I feel like it should be that way. Why is it even a big deal? If someone oh, wants to have sex with someone, I and that other person wants to get paid for doing it, it's like, please just let them do it. If they're adults and they know what they're doing. I can't believe it's even an issue still. Yeah. But that's a whole other thing. I mean, I don't want to have to talk about fucking religion again. Okay, no, let's not. <laughs> Can we, we have one episode <laughs> without religion in it. I would like we to can't. have. You know what I would like? I would what? like all of Hollywood hunks mm-hmm. to like bare minimum religion talk. Yeah. That's why I was like, we need to do a Hollywood hunk season. Okay. Sounds good. We're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. This is the beginning of it. (laughs) One of the things like, this is just something we already talked about, but I just Mm want to say this because it's Mm -hmm. from a speech that he gives at one point and it's talking about the older women and like the woman he was with at the beginning of the movie. I'm just kind of like jumping all over, but later when he's with Michelle Lauren Hutton and they have begun their like emotional connection after she initiated sex by offering to pay for it. Then she's just like, you know, why do you do this? And why do you choose older women? And then they've like just finished having sex. So they're both naked. And he gets out of bed and there's like full male nudity, which is another rarity. And it just seems really natural. And it's from far away. It's not a hot shot. No, it's not like a hot shot crotch close up or anything, mm-hmm. but it's there. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, hmm. And it's prolonged. He's just like having a full conversation nude standing by a window and then he's just saying like i like older women like what's the point of being with a teenage girl which first of all we don't want you to be with teenage girls can you just pick age appropriate <laughs> like there's things in between sir but he's like uh you know they they get off so easy just from like watching a movie or whatever and he's like i like the challenge i prefer an older woman and then he's like the woman i was with last night She's had probably hasn't had an orgasm in 10 years. It took me three hours to get her off. And then he says, like, but who else is going to do it? You know, her husband's not going to do it. Yeah. Who else who is going to would... take the time? Yeah. Or to care about it. And that's what he finds rewarding. And yeah, that's when American women fell <laughs> in love with Julian, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I never really found like Richard Gere attractive. I was like, I never thought he was ugly, but I was never like, mm, Richard Gere gets my gears going or anything ah. like that. <laughs> it's so cheesy. I'm sorry. I know but I, I wasn't it. like, he's cute. He's obviously just like a traditionally handsome man. Mm-hmm. But I can see why, like having seen this movie, how he became like established as a sex symbol for sure. Like emblazoned in the hearts of American women of the time. And relating back to being ready and willing to spend three hours (laughs) bringing a woman to orgasm (laughs) who has been like really sexually blocked for her whole life. Later, Michelle tells him like, you won't let me please you. Oh, yeah. And so you realize that he is, he has trouble feeling, opening up to the vulnerability of someone else pleasing him. That's an interesting dynamic. And it makes me wonder what his earlier life was like. Yeah, we don't really know anything about him in that regard. He doesn't Mm -hmm. really have a personality. 
in a way. He doesn't really. He just has his looks. And I guess he's supposed to be charming because he can like get into places that other people can't. He's not like a traditional gigolo of the time. Like he's more high class so they can take him to proper places because he knows how to look and act and behave. But yeah, you really don't see much of him. He's just very like quiet and pretty like the same facial expression all the time and the same tone of voice all the time level flat almost which is part of the reason why it's easy whenever madam ann is like you killed her didn't you because she like gets really has this moment of really intense hostility where she's like of course you killed her she seems so certain and it's like ooh, this woman has no faith left in men that she immediately goes to the worst possible outcome Mm -hmm. uh, for someone she knows, that he's a murderer. The whole time up until that point, I think it's clear he's been framed. Because also he was with that woman and we saw that. The woman that he takes, that she takes him to Sotheby's. Mm -hmm. Um, And... Even the, even with that, whenever Anne makes that accusation, she's so certain in that moment that I think, wait, I don't know anything about this guy at all. Mm-hmm. All I know about this guy is how he appears to be. At a completely surface level. The voyeuristic camera angles only add to that mystery that we're not seeing things from his perspective. We're watching something happen to him as an object of desire. There's also the implication that anytime you enjoy sexuality, because you enjoy sexuality, <laughs> your sexuality, that, and maybe you want to do it for fun and profit, that you're going to get in big trouble and you're going to be punished by the universe. And that happens to Julian. Yeah. He, he's being persecuted and punished for being excellent at his job. Right. Of sexually pleasing women. So this is actually like an anti woman movie (laughs) because the person who dedicates their life to giving women pleasure is punished and accused of murder and has to quit doing it the woman who's murdered is murdered because she's not being a good sex object i think this movie is pretty pro feminine though don't you I was just kind of just kidding, but yeah, I mean, I I wasn't, I'm happy with it. I know you're kidding too. Yeah. I wasn't Mm -hmm. saying it. I was just kind of stating it more like that is something that happens quite often in fiction of a person enjoying their sexuality and Mm -hmm. being punished. Yeah. To the extent that it's there and you don't see it. Cause it's just there all the time. Just like how when that movie came out, a lot of people wondered about the woman who was murdered. They wondered, what did she do to make him so mad? I mean, I grew I remember growing up here and stuff like that about women getting hit or murdered or Mm -hmm. whatever. It's like, I wonder what she did. Yeah. Nobody was asking why, like, what's what's going on with him? that he can't regulate his emotions to such an extent that he's having a violent tantrum that takes another human being's life. Nah, let's talk about what she did wrong. It's just easier that way. Because there's always something that she did wrong. (laughs) So I'm a she, so I can say that. (laughs) (laughs) Obviously, that's her (laughs) path. Can we just talk about Michelle's husband for a minute? Oh, yeah. Michelle's husband is a senator and he's like running for governor or something. I don't know. He's already something and he wants to be something more. 
-hmm. And then she's there at like a, the fundraiser function that he's having. And then Julian is there as the date of this other older, elegant woman. And so when they're in the receiving line to meet him, he comes like face to face with Michelle and she's like, (gasps) but of course he like plays it cool. He doesn't want to blow their cover. Mm -hmm. Um, But then later the Senator like catches on and he has someone tailing Julian and he knows that like they're having an affair and then he confronts Julian and he's like, what are you doing? You're trying to blackmail my wife. And Julian's like, no, it's nothing like that. She's with me because she wants to be with me. Yada, yada. And then the senator's like, basically has a moment, which I was drawing a parallel to the pretty woman moment where Julia Roberts is with Jason Alexander from Seinfeld. And he basically treats her like a, but they call her a prostitute. Maybe some just in the prostitute. Mm-hmm. And, um, and like smacks her. And that's the first time in the movie where she really is like kind of comes out of because she's in it with like a dream scenario with Richard Gere where he's treating her really well. And then Jason Alexander comes along and like makes a brutal basically attack on her and makes her feel like she is just there as a piece of meat for money. And then the senator has like a similar parallel moment with Richard Gere where he basically is just like, you're just a male whore. You know, and then Julian's like, like, you're only in these clubs at the mercy of these people. And they all know that you don't really belong here. And because Julian's kind of like living under the illusion that like, he's the same as these people that he's with, but he's not like he is just there by their good graces. And they all know what he is and what he's doing there. He's paid help. So the senator like cuts him down to size. (sighs) That was an intense moment. I was just going to say, this is completely unrelated. I'm sorry. I'm really all over the place. But during the senator's speech, (laughs) one of the things he's saying, like during his campaign dinner speech, he's like, we have the technology to free America from the grips of fossil fuels. (laughs) (laughs) And then he's saying something like, and the privilege should lead the way. And I'm just like, what is happening? (laughs) This is so hilarious. I know. The privilege should lead the way. Yeah. And it's as like, if there was a time when that wasn't the case. <laughs> How long are we going to have the same conversations? Forever? It's like, we're still having these conversations 42 years later. Well, and it's not changed. I mean, people know their capacity of observation of the world is in this more immediate self-centered way Mm -hmm. that doesn't see negative outcomes because they feel that they're entitled to the best outcome because they are the best and therefore they will be rewarded for it. Which is kind of like what I feel like what the senator's attitude is. And so whenever you have an attitude like that, it's easy to just like discount that there are way more people that are not in your position that Mm -hmm. don't have the resources to control their immediate environment at all times, which is really what money is, is it's the ability to immediately control your environment to make it as comfortable as possible at all times. You get mm-hmm. the best feeling fabrics, you get the best food, you get, you know, whatever it is you want to pay for. Julian, he's a hot commodity. Of course. I just want to say that I really like how he's in this nice apartment. I'm guessing that he just move there almost seems like yeah or he just isn't settled in and he has all of his pictures stacked on the ground which I identify with so strongly as someone who moves frequently I feel like there's been so many times where I've just had a room with all my pictures stacked on the ground because hanging them seems like such a chore and also a commitment and then I felt like that was kind of like representative Julian kind of like living in between two worlds where he's like a sex worker but he doesn't want to fully identify as a sex worker and he doesn't want to like fully commit 
to any of it. And at one point he finally does hang like one picture and that's right before everything blows up in his life. And then he ends up tearing that picture down while he's looking for what's been planted and he just steps all over it. So it's like, I was finally like getting settled into something and now it's all destroyed. I just feel like the pictures were like representing. I just felt like that's kind of how he was. Like he wanted all the benefits of being the sex worker, the gigolo, but he didn't want to like identify as that. So that's why he didn't really like to have repeat clients and he wouldn't like stick with the rules or stick with one manager for long. But then like when he needed someone, like when he was really being framed and when he's very desperate at the end and he comes to Leon, like, I'll do whatever you want. Like I'll sleep with whoever you want me to, even men. And I'll let you have like 70, 30. And he's just begging for everything. And so he's like lowering himself back down to how he would have been maybe in the beginning of his career, or like all of the sex workers that he makes fun of now, because he thought he was better than them. And he's like willing to do that to get the protection that they all have because they pay for it. And like, now it's too late because he's, he's alienated himself from like, that world that they're all in, but he, then he wants to get back in it when he needs the protection from them. But he needs protection from the guy who he needs protection from. Yeah. So it's like, he doesn't realize that until the very end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I feel like once he gets to Leon's, he's like, Oh, wait a second. You actually just totally set me up for this. Yeah. And that it was a convenience for you. And he's like, why'd you pick me? Mm-hmm. And people keep trying to shame him mm-hmm. for his sex work job, right? And he's not buying it. Mm-hmm. He's not ashamed. So part of it is like, I wonder if why he's not identifying as a gigolo or a whore is because he doesn't have shame. And mm-hmm. those are words that people we're leveling at him as a way to shame him. Mm -hmm. And so like, I guess maybe part of what I was reading into it was like that that's why he wasn't identifying that way. Cause he felt like the service he was providing was transcended this like seedy idea of this, you know, degradating, degradating, degrading, degrading, degradating or degradation (laughs) degradate yeah degrading act that people Mm -hmm. perform in like bar bathrooms or something not what he was doing like he's doing something therapeutic really what he's doing is giving these women what he cannot receive himself i got the impression that he is probably somebody that really doesn't orgasm and that's why he can keep going because no one can ever please him Mm because he's locked up sexually and that's why he's trying to gift that to these women. It's beautiful. And then Leon falls to his death and we're left with a boot (laughs) in the hands of Julian. So Julian accidentally knocks him over yeah. the balcony because Leon's really tall and the ledge is not that high. Mm-hmm. And then he tries to save him. He's like desperately holding on. It's really prolonged. And then Leon's like, I can't reach you. And then he falls. But luckily there were witnesses that saw Julian trying to save him. So later they dropped that charge. Thank God. So he doesn't have yeah. two murder charges against him in like a matter of two weeks. Yeah. And he was even like screaming, like, don't die. And like, Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it was super obvious that he was. So at least he's got that going for him. Well, and then that also to me was like demonstrating that he isn't cold blooded or something. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, he did need, he could have potentially he needed Leon because of the murder charge. Also, it was just obvious that he didn't want him to die because he right. didn't want anyone to die. Mm-hmm. So it was intense. It was an intense ending. Michelle's like, 
I'm going to provide you with an alibi, mm-hmm. even though it's going to completely blow up my life and destroy my husband's career, probably. And everything's going to be totally different. I'm going to do this thing because I love you and I know that you're not guilty. Yeah. And so she makes this really big sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And it's an act of unconditional love. And you realize that that's what, by providing these women with the space to feel unconditional love enough to have an orgasm, you know, he's been searching for that for himself. But he didn't dare ask for that. So he just had to go around trying to provide it for other people. Mm. You know, the the mm-hmm. women that he himself really wants the unconditional love from. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, at the very end, whenever Michelle comes and is like, I gave you an alibi and like, this is what <laughs> is going down and I'm with you and I love you and we're together and I saved you, really. I mean, she did. She saved him. He's like, my God, Michelle, it's taken so long to get to you. Oh, I feel like I'm going to get teary-eyed. Yeah. I know. I actually got, I got a little bit weepy whenever he said that. I know. Because it's like he really was just searching for someone to accept him and love him mm-hmm. in a real way. Oh, my gosh. She came into the whole relationship knowing what he did. Mm -hmm. Um, She didn't care about any of that. She just wanted to be with him because she knew there was something about him, you know? Yeah. This is maybe one of the greatest, you know, romantic movies in this really surprising way. I'm a huge fan. Yeah, so at the end, he's already in prison because he's facing the charges for the Palm Springs woman murder still, but she's going to help get him off. And so he's in like his blue prison jeans and blue denim shirt. And they're at like the booths where you have to talk to each other over the phone. And it almost felt, it had like a religious feel. It's almost like a confessional booth. And then she comes and says that to him, that I'm going to give you the alibi. And then she puts her hand on the glass and you just see her hand and like his face. And then he puts his head against her hand when he says that. And it felt kind of like, I don't know if it had like a religious feeling to me. So I know we weren't going to bring religion into it, but there was just something about that scene where I felt like, Hmm, did he direct some other movie? Like, did he do any religious movies? He didn't do last temptation of Christ. I thought he was, I thought he was uh, one of the writers on last temptation. Of Christ. I think he was. And I was like, I'm feeling some religious vibes here. Oh, well, I love that movie. Mm -hmm. I Uh, still haven't seen it. That movie makes me weep uh, with joy. Beautiful movie. Mm -hmm. I can see, like, from the ending of this movie, I felt like it was very simple, but, like, so moving and so beautiful. Yeah. Well, well, it's like she was um, offering him salvation. Yeah. And he just put his hand, his head, like, against her hand and rested his head, like, could finally, like, relax into someone and, like, settle. Even though he's in prison still. I'm getting, like, more teary-eyed now than when I actually watched it. (laughs) (laughs) What's going on? (laughs) Anyway, I give this movie five stars. Yeah, this is a great movie. But I still would have just liked it better without... The weird murder part to be honest i wish there were like a different vehicle to bring them to that point mm-hmm. i just enjoyed watching him interacting and watching his life but it was still good i still really liked it he needed to be falsely persecuted and then saved murdering a woman is the easiest way to do that in a movie mm-hmm. murdering a woman is the easiest way in a movie for the lead male character to have some sort of emotional growth. Mm -hmm. And so in a lot of ways, it's like a lazy plot device. I thought it was a really 
accurate snapshot of the violence that was happening, the particular type of sexual violence that was happening against women at that time in a way that was almost socially sanctioned. There were so many sexual serial killers that were active in that time period. There were so many uh, sexploitation and violent sexual movies that were happening coming out in that time period. There was just this particular aggression against women. And it was like, now we've had a sexual liberation. So that means that if you are a woman and I think that you are hot, that I'm entitled to have sex with you, whether you like it or not. And there was like this weird attitude. And whenever women weren't okay with that, men got really mad about it. You're taking their bottle away. Don't say mother's milk. (laughs) We have to have an episode without mother's milk. (laughs) So a dark ending. Now I'm going to lighten it up with some trivia. Yeah. Just a little bit. Yes. This isn't trivia, but I just wanted to bring up this one part of the movie that I thought was really funny. And when... Towards the end, he was out looking for Leon. He's like, have you seen Leon? And they're like, I think he's at Club Probe. (laughs) Which is like a hilarious name. And then so he goes to this club and it's like space agey looking for the 80s. And it's like a gay bar. And it's basically like everyone in there looks like they're from the village people. Was it really like this? Or are they just being super stereotypical? It's the leather daddy bar. And, I mean, they had like real S and M clubs. Yeah, and I mean, before AIDS in cities, a lot of people who were sexually curious <laughs> and wanted to have experiment with strangers and whatnot. That was a different. I like, mean, that I, still happens. Yeah, it's a secretive space. But within that space, it's completely open where there's Mm -hmm. like people having sex with each other out in the open, like lots of popper action, Mm -hmm. um, dancing, lots of leather. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that that was like a stereotype because there were lots of bars like that. Yeah. I've just everyone was like. like. A bar like that where literally everyone was wearing, like, a motorcycle cap and leather chaps. Well, not everybody. And they were all, it was like, they were all dancing, like, equidistant from each other. It was just really looked like so choreographed. I'm sure it was totally choreographed. I'm like, people would be closer together, I would guess. They were all, like, keeping six feet apart or something while they were dancing. (laughs) But, um... So, but as he's walking into the bar, it looks like he's walking into like the spaceship from Alien. It mm-hmm. was really cool. Just imagining what it would be like to walk into a bar like that in the 80s where it's like so space staged. Mm-hmm. It would have been fun. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's all. I just love Club Probe because like Aliens Probe you. So it was all right. like alien thing. <laughs> okay. Moving on. But so the trivia that I read only a little bit is, do you know who they originally wanted to play American Gigolo? John Travolta. Before that. Who? You just stole my thunder. Damn but it. before that, <laughs> someone else. Robert Redford. No. Harrison Ford. Take one more guess. Um, John Malkovich. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> Christopher Reeves, Superman. Whoa. Yeah. Huh. Oh. But he declined. Oh, there's a there's a Hollywood hunk I totally forgot about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he seemed like a nice guy too. Yeah. Like a real nice Superman. guy. Superman. Um, yeah, so then he declines, and then they're like, okay, John Travolta, because he was like hot off of Saturday Night Fever and all that stuff. And so that's when Armani agreed to be the wardrobe provider for the movie because John Travolta was like hot stuff. And they were like, 
okay, we'll do it for him. And then that like promoted Armani as well. But then like at the last minute, John Travolta got cold feet and backed out. And then they took Richard Gere, who is a pretty much relatively unknown. He'd only really done one movie before then. But then that catapulted him. I mean, he's great in this role. I, think he's I don't. Great. I don't feel like either one of them. No. Would have worked. I don't either. I feel like Christopher Reeves is like too wholesome, but maybe that's just how I think of him now because he's Superman. And if it were John Travolta, uh, it would have just taken like a more seedy vibe to me. Like a, I think because of. Um, Saturday Night Fever and the other movie, Staying Alive. I get like a, but mainly those movies, I get like a queasy feeling when I think about him from then. Cause he was so just, he was a bad person in those movies, wasn't he? The boy in the bubble. (laughs) I mean, he wasn't a bad person in that movie, was he? (laughs) He was stuck in a bubble. (laughs) But I just feel like, I don't want, I don't know. I think no, he like, I hit the girl in that one movie, and he was just like a real macho mm-hmm. asshole in those movies. And I don't think yeah. it would have worked. Oh, you know what else, though, is um, the Grease movie. Ew, gross. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not a Grease fan either. Me either. Me either. We're like some of the only people in the world. I know. Did you notice I just, my middle, my middle mm-hmm. finger just casually went up. I didn't even do that on purpose. That's how I feel about that. Wow. Yeah. I'm not into it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would have actually just asked to not watch this movie if it were John Travolta instead. Oh, I don't think I would have watched it either. But I do think we should watch like Saturday Night Fever sometime or Staying Alive, one of the two. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I didn't see Saturday Night Fever until I was a teenager. Oh, okay. Actually, did you see it as a kid? Yeah. Okay. Well, then, yeah, we could watch mm-hmm. that. Yeah, we'll definitely. T- so when I was in high school, mm-hmm. I dated, not for very long, I dated this guy, Eric, and he had a band he was in a band it was a ska band but I never heard his band but this one day he called me and he was like uh I'm I've been hanging out you know with my band and wanted you to meet them you know and I was like oh okay cool my parents weren't home at the time two cars pull up Mm -hmm. people keep getting out of the cars (laughs) and I'm like what's going on and Eric's like I want you to meet my band. And there's like eight people. So he oh brought like God. eight people over to my house. And, I, you know, he's in a ska band. I like don't even think about it. Well, then right when everybody's like on the porch, because I was like, I can't let everybody in. Like when my parents get home, they would not like it. Everybody mm-hmm. was cool. They totally understood. So it was nice weather. It was fine. We were on the porch. So then my parents get home and they hadn't even like met him. They, I didn't get in trouble or anything because they do. Um, but then later, my mom was like, that Eric looks like Richard Gere, like a young Richard Gere. Oh and my. I was like, I was like, ew. And then after that, I was just like, like whenever <laughs> I would, whenever I would, I would like think like, oh, my mom thinks you're like cute. And it kind of like made things weird. And then mm-hmm. we weren't together for very much longer. But <laughs> that's my like Richard Gere mom story Mm -hmm. did you see it like once she said it could you not unsee it yeah well oh my god question (laughs) question have you ever been framed for murder (laughs) oh my god (laughs) let's just go with it if you've ever been framed for murder email us at copyrightspodcast at gmail.com Or you can DM us on Twitter or Instagram. I really hope you share the story with us. (laughs) Yes, please. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you guys for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, We enjoyed making it. We appreciate you. You can follow us on Twitter. And um, also you can check out our Patreon if you would like to subscribe. There's a lot of great content. Holly's been working like mad on it. 
and just like uploading and uploading and creating and making and providing entertainment for you, for your listening pleasure. Check it out. Um, There's different levels. If you want to support the show, we'd really appreciate it. Otherwise, you could support us by rate reviewing and subscribing. We'd really appreciate that too. And thank you for listening. Even if you don't do any of those things, just thank you for listening. Bye. See you next Tuesday. (laughs) Bye. Thank you for listening to Cover Your Eyes Podcast.